guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, Jay and I are here and we are going to be filming a video all about, and he's watching golf right now. No, I'm not. He's watching golf. Um, we are going to be filming a video talking all about uh, how to get a chair sized correctly. Jay is um, in the field, so I'll have him introduce himself a little bit and talk about what he does. But I'm excited about this because a lot of questions that I get are how do you get a chair sized correctly? Why is my chair so big? Blah, blah, blah. And hopefully we answer some of those questions because he's a professional. And uh, yeah, let's dive in. You wanna say what you do? Also, this is Bailey. She's, uh, she's new to the family. Um, so I'm Jay. Um, I'm what's called an assistive technology professional, um, also known as an ATP. Um, in our industry, we love our acronyms. Basically, um, what my role is in in the industry is helping end users to select um, the appropriate equipment for them um, based off what they like. Um, my, my portion, I guess, comes into the actual fitment of the chair. So there's a bunch of different manufacturers out there that offer different features and benefits um, from one to the next. So what I would recommend you do before moving into a new chair, whether it be your first chair as a newly injured person or um, if you are a vet and have been into a chair for um, quite a while, it's always good to do your research to know what new advancements and what new technologies are out there because companies are coming out with new stuff mm -hmm. every year. Yeah. Um, so it's always really good to do your research before you move into uh, new chair selection. Um, the way I like to operate is, as an ATP, is I like to present you with all of your options out there um, because it's your chair. You're going to be the one that's going to be in this thing day in and day out. Um, so you need to be happy with what you what you select. Mm -hmm. Similar to like a car, whether you're a Chevy, a Ford, or a Dodge fan, um, know what's out there and, and, and find your preferences and find what you like. If you're new and you don't know what you like, your ATP is gonna kinda help guide you on what their, what their thoughts are um, as far as customer service, material use, um, fitment, et cetera. Um, they're gonna be your guide. Yeah, I, and that's, basically what he does is he goes in when he gets a call someone is uh you know looking for a chair also sorry side note stella is currently snoring welcome to our home this is an ongoing thing um and we're just gonna go with it okay because uh this is our home we are full of dogs now and we're constantly dealing with snoring so i just wanted to bring in jay because i feel like there's a lot of you that are newly injured newly, newly diagnosed and you're kind of like, where do I go? I have a chair maybe, or I'm about to get a chair, maybe I have a loner. So question for you, if someone is newly diagnosed, newly injured, or new to getting a wheelchair, what would be the first thing that they do? So first thing you're gonna probably do, depending on, on where you're at and who you're working with, um, if you're newly injured, newly diagnosed, generally you will be um, working with either a seating clinic or a physical therapist or occupational therapist that has some sort of background in seating and positioning that will kind to kind of help guide you in the right direction as far as selecting your your proper vendor because um, there's a lot of vendors out there that that do um, what we do a lot of various companies out there um, and so depending on what uh, vendors that PT OT or seating clinic works with um, they'll kind of get you connected with someone like me um, who can come in and then size you for, for the chair. Also, uh, another thing you want to look at um, when actually um, come down to this, when it comes down to the sizing of the chair, um, you want to look at whether or not your patient is going to be growing. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the times if you have a, a younger client, um, depending on the diagnosis or injury, um, you want to think within the next five years. What is going to be happening to their body? Um, are they 10 years old, 12 years old, going to be going through that that little growth spurt right around that, that age where you need to account for um, yeah. Yeah, seat depth, seat width, um, how has your weight been? Are you fluctuating in weight? Because um, the way I like to design my chairs, I like to design the chairs to fit like an extension of your body. Um, because if there's any loss uh, or if there's any movement of you in the chair, that equates to loss of transference of energy. Um, if you're sloppy moving around in that thing and you're not kind of hugged in, you're not going to, in the long run, get as much distance per push 
meaning you're gonna have to do more pushes throughout the day to cover that same distance, which means that's going to put more wear and tear on your upper extremities, rotator cuffs, elbows, hands, wrists, um, because the body wasn't designed to do this all day. It wasn't designed to be your main uh, mode of mobility. Yeah. Um, so I like my chairs to fit like an extension of your body. Um, I feel like with that though, it's so hard because I find so many, and I can only speak for spinal cord injury because that's all that I really know about, is what's hard for me is when I see someone who's newly injured and they have a chair that is so big for them and I'm like, why would someone put you in that? And they're like, well, they thought that we would, you know, gain weight. And yes, people do gain weight after spinal cord injury. That is very normal. But also for me, I did the complete opposite. I shrank, like my legs shrank because I don't use them. You had a lot so of atrophy. It, yeah, I had so much atrophy. So it's so sad for me when I see someone that has this chair that's like two inches big for them on both sides. And I'm like, why did that happen? But it's also hard to tell from an ATP standpoint, I'm sure is like, are they going to gain weight? Are they going to lose muscle? Are there, is their legs going to shrink? That's like also really hard for, I think you guys, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, like I said, um, the body does a lot of different things depending on diagnosis or level of injury or age of, of the patient. And as I alluded to before, generally you're able to get a new chair every five years. A lot of people don't know this. It's one of the things that I find out is a lot of people don't know like the ins and outs of the industry and what, what they are or what they have available to them. So general rule of thumb uh, is you can get a new frame um, or a new chair every five years, um, new cushion and back every two years, mm -hmm. um, generally. Um, there are loopholes to that. For instance, let's say if you have a, a younger client um, who goes through a really big growth spurt, something that you really couldn't predict for. Um, there are loopholes or caveats to that general five-year rule. If you're way too big for the chair and you really can't fit into it properly, it's causing you skin breakdown on say like your hips from the side guards rubbing, um, yeah. or it's just it's too long or too short for you. Um, you, there are some loopholes to that that five year mark, but generally, like I said, about every five years uh, for a new new chair, every two two years for a cushion or back. Yeah, that's actually, and that's something good to, to point out too, is like, you guys have to figure out also, cause we only know what's like really California. I mean, you probably know more than me, but I only know like what's in California. And a lot of people don't realize that you could probably get a manual chair and to say a smart drive or a power assist with it, but it also depends what on your, on your insurance. It's gonna depend on, on your insurance, um, having a qualifying diagnosis and that kind of where, it, that part of the whole order process is kind of dependent on, on the ATP or your vendor. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that you you qualify for what they are prescribing, um, private insurances tend to, um, in some cases, uh, tend to be more apt to pay for certain upgrades um, that, um, say, government funded insurances necessarily won't. Um, things like titanium, carbon fiber, some of those nicer things that people like to have that make the chair a little bit lighter, more user friendly, etc. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times those things aren't covered. I mean, even with some private insurances, um, you don't end up getting that covered and it at that point ends up um, falling on you to pay out of pocket for those upgrades yeah. or extras. Which I also, for that, a lot of people don't know. So like, if you didn't understand what he just said, please rewind, go back to what he just said. Because if you look, for instance, at my chair, my chair specifically, they a lot of the things that are on my chair are upgraded. So if, if you're looking at my chair, for instance, and I can only base it off of this, and you're like, I want this chair, which a lot of you guys have messaged me, like, I want your exact chair. How did, how did you get this? A lot of them are upgraded. So if you want carbon fiber things, if you want things that are, you want titanium, which is lighter than aluminum, it is probably going to be an upgrade. So I would say, hold off do a fundraiser, ask your family for Christmas, hey, I need you know X amount of dollars towards this or that. Hold off because you guys, we're gonna be sitting in this for the next five years. So don't get something just because you're, you're ready for insurance. Go in and get something when you're actually ready. Like don't do it just because you're like, oh, I have to get it because my five years is up because we're gonna be sitting in it because for their side of things, they then, if you're unhappy or say you go and talk to someone else in the chair and you're like, we're like, why did you get this? Why couldn't you get that? 
and then you end up upset after you've already gotten the chair, after you've already signed for it, then if you go and you file a complaint with say an ATP, when you've already then done research and figured out what you really want, this <laughs> so story is so loud, um, then it comes back on them when you've already signed off on it. So the goal with this too is make sure you guys research what you want, like you said in the very beginning, research what you want ahead of time. Reach out to us as end users and say, what would you suggest that I get? Me, for instance, I can only say out of a paraplegic spinal cord injury is you don't need an adjustable chair, which an ATP would say something different. Okay. I only know because of, I've been in a chair for 10 years, I'm going on 11, I know what I want. I don't need it adjusted. If you're newly injured, yes, get a chair that's adjustable. It's going to add weight. ATPs would say it only adds a little bit of weight. But to us, after transferring, in and out of the cars, in and out, that little weight does add a lot over time. But if you're newly injured, yes, get a chair that's adjustable. I don't need push handles, because I'm a para and I rather not have them. I can have someone just push my back. Question for you as my fiance. Mm -hmm. Not having push handles, does that hurt for you? Is it, does no. it not matter? No, um, okay. it doesn't really matter to me specifically. Um, because if you ever need, need help, I can, I can just I can just grab your rigidizer bar and, just push. Um, and, and give you a little hand when yeah. necessary or just even straight on the back canes. Yeah. Um, but some people like push handles. Um, yeah. Depending on level of injury, I know that I have some of my, my quadriplegic um, patients that do what's called the quad hook where they'll reach back mm -hmm. to put, reposition themselves and they'll actually hook their elbow right onto that push handle. So um, like I said, it's really finding out what's gonna, gonna work for you. Um, and as Chelsea said, um, if you are newly injured, highly recommend um, finding a chair that does give you some level of adjustability. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you can, you can adjust it, kind of play with it till you really, really, really dial in exactly what, yeah. what you want, where your center of gravity is, what your foot plate height needs to be, um, what you want your camber to be at, et cetera. Um, because once you move into a, like, let's say a higher level chair, um, for instance, Chelsea's chair, which is, has no adjustability, everything's all welded into place. Um, it definitely makes the chair a lot lighter because you don't have all those components that allow for the chair to be adjusted. Um, definitely makes yeah. the chair lighter, but as she said, she's been in a chair for 10 years now, over 10 years, and she knows exactly what she wants because she's had those adjustable chairs. She's had the chairs where they were heavier, but it allowed her to figure out exactly what she wants. Yeah. Um, and then also she's not growing either. She's not gonna go through any growth spurts. Um, her weight's been pretty consistent, so um, she's not going through excessive. I mean, quarantine, you know, got me like this last year, but you know, okay. Um, but <laughs> for the most part, she's she's 28 years old. She's not gonna be going through any she's growth spurts. Um, she, her weight's pretty consistent. So we, we really know exactly what what she likes as far as seat width, seat depth, etc. Yeah. Um, and also then, too, also what you can take on and off are, uh, we call them nunchucks over here, but it's the, he's probably like, what are they? Um, what are they called? Removable armrests. Removable armrests. Okay. As a para, it's just an extra thing, an extra weight to carry around and have someone take on and off. As a para, I would suggest trying a chair that doesn't have it, but as a quad or someone else, I would, I don't know what to suggest for that. Steph doesn't have them and Natalie, I don't think Natalie has I don't Maybe she does. I'm not so sure. My, my thoughts on it, um, A, they add weight to the chair. Um, even just for the receivers to, to mount onto the chair, it adds weight. Yeah. And when you're talking about a chair um, transport weight, meaning without the cushion, without the wheels, you're looking at a chair that's 15 pounds. If you add a little bit of weight to that, you're really growing that that weight. So, um, I like I said, I don't like to add things to the chair if they are not necessary. My thought process on armrests, um, A, they add weight to the chair. B, if you give someone something to lean on, mm -hmm. chances are they're going to lean on it, which promotes bad posture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Really, I don't like them. But like I said, if they, if you like them, you feel that you need them, they, they assist you um, for in whatever way then go for them. It's yeah. your chair. Do what makes you happy. Um, I've also seen people say that like, oh, I use them for like to adjust like my weight, but I also have to adjust my weight. So what I do is I clench onto the side guard and my wheel and I push up that way. Mm -hmm. Instead of having um, 
the armrest. So that's also another option that you guys can do as well. Um, also, I want to talk about having uh, the center of gravity. So what I know is you always want the center of gravity, which is the wheel uh, where the axle is, that center of the wheel, over your head, correct? Generally, generally if you were to drop your arm straight yeah. down, general placement is going to be in, in line with your shoulders. Yeah. Um, and so the more further forward your adjustable, or the more further the wheel is, the more tippy it is. The more further back, the less you'll be able to actually do a wheelie. So a lot of you have reached out to me and saying like, I can barely do a wheelie in my chair. And it's probably because your center of gravity is far back, which could be because you're a high level injury or you are newly injured or, um, you know, one of those things and your, maybe your family or the person that size a chair doesn't want you to do a wheelie and like flip over backwards. Um, but once you get more comfortable in the chair, I would say then like you probably have an adjustable chair, move that more forward. So you can actually start teaching yourself if you can, how to go over like little bumps or cracks because the further it is back, the less you'll be able to do that. Right. Yeah. The more, the further it is back, the more front loaded your chair is meaning there's more weight up front. Mm -hmm. Um, Think of it like a teeter-totter. If it's exactly in the middle, you have really good balance right here. The more that you've, the further you pull it back, that front is gonna be heavily, heavily down. Um, so it's really, it's, it's a balancing act. Um, finding that proper center of gravity that A, works for you, which um, means that when you go to really push, if you're really getting after it, you're not popping that front yeah. end up but then also when you come to, let's say a, a door threshold or something where you have to get your casters up over, um, you wanna be able to pop those things, mm -hmm. th those things up relatively easy to continue on your, on your way. Yeah. So it, it literally is a balancing act. Um, and like I said, sweet spot. When, exactly. And when you're, when you're newly injured or you're into a new chair, um, having that adjustability mm -hmm. really, really helps um, because like I said, you can play with it. And then once you get that thing dialed in, you know, perfect. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a two inch COG. Uh, I'm a two and a half inch COG, center of gravity. Um, you really can, can dial in exactly where that is. And um, when it actually comes down to, um, to sizing a chair, um, like I said, the first, the first thing that we do as, as ATPs when it comes to sizing is we take very, very extensive measurements, um, hip width, seat depth. Um, I personally like to use a caliper um, for width and depth measurements because it really gets it straight on. Mm -hmm. um, basically what a caliper is and your vendor should have it. Um, basically think of a long yardstick um, with two things or actually one thing that slides along that yardstick. So you know this one's always at zero and depending on where you slide this. So if I was to go like say for Chelsea's waist, I slide it in, and I know her waist is exactly, what, you're 14 in this chair? Uh, 14 or a 13. Yeah, 14 or a 13, so you really- and you want like what, uh, you want to be able to push your hands in between and comfortable mm -hmm. enough, you know? Yeah, like I said- so you don't want pressure on your side guards. I like, I like my chairs when I build them, I like them to fit pretty snug mm -hmm. um, because I want it to feel, fit like a glove and feel like an extension yeah. of your body. So next question is, side guards. So I personally have bolted on side guards, which I swear by, I don't see the reason of wanting to have side guards that take them on and off because once you know what you want, there's no reason to take them off. Leave them on. You, if you have, unless, okay, Steph, I go off of Steph just because Steph is a quad, we call her super quad, um, but Steph is a quadriplegic. She has a low back. She has a back that actually like hugs her and sits her in it. Um, and she doesn't have to take on and off her backrest or fold it or anything. I have rigid or bolt on side guards because my back does not fold down. My back is low enough where when I transfer it into the car, I don't have to fold down the backrest. So it also depend on how high your backrest is. If you have a high backrest, then you're gonna need to probably fold it down if you're driving and wanna transfer it. So um, yeah, what do you thought, think about that? It really all depends on, on what works for you. A lot of the times when people have removable side guards, um, it, it depends on the way you're transferring. Um, if the way Chelsea's chair is set up, we profiled her side guards to match the, um, the profile of the rear wheel. 
Um, so basically meaning they're no higher um, or longer than the actual rear wheel. Um, oftentimes when people don't have um, side guards that match the profile of that rear wheel, the side guard might stick out a little bit past the wheel or a little bit higher, which might impact your transferability on and off the chair. Um, so that's when they're um, needed to be removed. Um, Why would someone want them higher? Um, for various reasons. Um, tucking and clothing. Um, I have also seen side guards that actually go over the wheel, which is really fendered, cool. Fendered side guards. Fendered side guards. That's pretty Those cool. Those help to um, keep your keep, clothes clean. Keep, well, keep debris, exactly. Keep debris off of your clothes. Keep your hands from coming in contact with the wheels. But I feel like for me, I put my hand on my actual like tire, tire and wheel. if I did that, oh my God, you all know that moment when you like hit something and you just like, it just, you think you broke your finger. I feel like I would do that a lot just because I already grabbed my like, my tire so much. Yeah. You know when you hit your brake and you're going up a hill and just, oh, yeah, that's what I feel like. But yeah, and then you were saying seat to floor height. So maybe we'll show you guys some examples of exactly what we're talking about with my chair. Um, Cause he wants to talk about sleep seat to floor height. I would like to touch on casters too. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things to consider um, when you are specking out the chair, um, like seat to floor height, dump, um, so wheel dump, size. So seat to floor height is what? So there's there's some things to touch on um, and look at when you're looking at actually specking the chair. First, obviously, seat width, um, getting something like I said that is fits snug to the body. Um, that's kind of form fitting, fits like a glove. Uh, me personally, that's how I like to, to design my chairs. Then also seat depth. Um, we like to place the body at 90s generally um, to get a good, nice seated position. Um, so when it comes to seat depth, you want your, your bender is gonna take a measurement from basically the bend of your knee, um, for layman's terms, back to the, the back of your back. And they're gonna measure that depth. I like to save um, a couple inches, generally two fingers between mm. the back of the knee and where that seat sling is gonna end because let's say if you're a para um, or you have trouble with your legs, having that little bit of room to get your hand in there to help you for transfers and picking up your legs makes I all the difference. I never thought about that. Also, you don't want your seat sling rubbing on, on the back of your calf. So yes, I have a scar from that. Yeah, so having, having a proper seat depth um, is key. Um, also, from there, we can move into seat to floor height. Uh, generally, when I'm starting out, I like to spec my front seat height right around 18 inches, depending on the user, um, because in my experience, I think I've been in this industry for eight, nine years now, um, generally 18 inches is a good starting point because when you're looking at various seating services, chairs, toilets, couches, things like that, getting in and out of standard cars. Generally what I found is 18 inches in the front tends to be a good start um, when you're looking at say like a first time user if you don't already know exactly what you want for your front seat height. Um, and then transferring from front seat height back to rear seat height, I generally like to start with an inch and a half to two inches of dump, meaning I like the rear seat height to be about an inch and a half to two inches lower than the front seat height, because what that does, it kind of creates a bucket mm -hmm. and lets gravity hold you back into, into the chair um, and kind of helps lock that pelvis in. Um, and what that does when you lock your pelvis in Proximal control increases distal function. So when you are very locked in and secure down here, you're a lot stronger up here. Mm -hmm. Think of it as holding a gallon of milk way out here. You're gonna be able to hold that gallon of milk a lot longer if it's closer into your body than it is way out here. When I was in football, we used to do the helmet drills where we had to hold our football helmets out here and whoever lasted the longest didn't have to run laps at the end of practice. I also feel like for that too is like the more dump you have if you can or the higher your knees are, yes, it will put more pressure into your sit bones, but it which could cause other things. But if you're a para and you get out of your chair a lot, my dump that I have in this chair feels good because then I can put my 
hands out more, I can reach things. I feel like I'm actually in the chair instead of on top of the chair. So for me, I like having dump instead of having it flat because it creates more of a in the chair rather than on top of the chair. And then the more lower your knees are, the more you wanna fall forward because we obviously, if you can't you know, push into your legs, then it's hard to, to balance, so and yeah. generally when you're looking at rear seat to floor height or even overall seat to floor height, when you're seated in the chair um, and you drop your arms straight down, you want the tip of your middle finger to land somewhere right here in the center of the hub. And that's a really, really good starting yeah. point to make sure that you are properly seated in the chair. So that way, when you reach back for the wheels, you can are able to then cover the max distance or get the max distance per push, yeah. which limits the amount of pushes that you have to do throughout the day, which um, saves on fatigue, um, repetitive use injuries, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Um, and then back height, um, choosing a back height that, that fits for you. Um, with Chels as a T10, we were able to take her back height um, a little bit lower um, because she has some core strength. It's really kind of finding that fine line where it's not impeding your movement up top where you can reach back for something. For example, her she has a, a pocket back here. It's called an air breathable adjustable back. Air breathable tension that, adjustable back. Yes. Um, I get that question so much, so that's what it's called. It's a it's a tie light product um, that allows for air transmission through the backrest. So especially down here in Southern California, when we get our hot summer winds that come in. Um, it helps to help regulate her body temperature. It's also cool because it's lightweight, has a, has a pocket like back pocket. here in the back. I didn't know any of those um, extra things. Yeah, but then, um, like I said, having a lower back allows her more freedom of movement up top because she has some, some core strength because her pelvis is locked in. She has stability. Yeah. Depending on your level of injury, if you may, you may need a higher back, you may need a, a rigid back if you don't have a lot of core strength, if you're a higher yeah. level injury. And there's also different kinds of backrests that you can get. There's ADI, there's this one. There's so many different ones and we don't Robo, need to like go. rigid, there's, there's a bunch. Yeah, Sunrise has their own stuff. Um, there's a lot of other components that are out there. I also want to chat really quick before we end this video. There's so much more things that Jay can talk about because he is so dialed in on exactly it's what all the this tip is. Of the iceberg. We could literally have this video be an hour and a half long, but I don't want to do that to you guys. So the last thing that I think I want to mention is talking about casters, which can you clean my casters out? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, it's caster size. So for me as a wheelchair dancer, I like having, what size caster do I have? You're on a four by seven point seven five. So when it comes to uh, front caster size selection, um, generally the smaller the caster, the more responsive it'll be. Um, so depending on your user's activity level um, will help to determine your caster size selection. For our elderly population that's not as active as say Chels who's not dancing in her chair or really getting after it throughout the day, we can typically go with a, a larger size caster, like your six or five inch caster. Um, it'll turn a lot slower, it'll be a lot more steady for the user depending on, on what they're doing. Um, and then as you move down in caster size, like let's say to the four inch casters that Chelsea has or even smaller three inch casters that you'll see on your sports chairs, um, like tennis where you're really getting after it or rugby um, where you need to make those quick responsive turns, the smaller caster will turn a lot faster and be more responsive. The smaller the caster, um, the more responsive it'll be. Also, um, caster width selection and, and material. Um, I personally, um, there's a, a caster out there that I really like, it's called the soft roll caster. Um, it's a little bit, little bit wider. Um, it's less likely to find those cracks in, in the pavement um, it does turn slightly slower than say a, a narrower caster because it has more surface area, but it's made out of material that when you do come across imperfections in, in your rolling surface, um, rocks, cracks in the sidewalk, etc., cetera, um, you're less likely to get that road shock um, because it has a little bit of an absorbency factor built into it. Um, and I think for Chels, having a thinner, smaller caster, especially when she's doing her spins and stuff and dancing helps helps you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I like this size caster just because I've always had this size, um, but I do have a lot of you that reach out to me and then I look at your caster and whenever I do like Zoom classes or anything. So if you're trying to turn your chair around, the bigger the caster, the more 
time it will take. So that will be hard for being inside the home, et cetera, traveling. Um, so maybe take a look at what your options are for a four inch caster. But the only thing is, is if you do change the caster size, that changes something with the chair, correct? Um, or no? Yeah, I mean, depending on your on your caster size and your, your fork height. Um, like if someone had a, a bigger caster and they wanted to go to my size, like just could they just change it look at look at your your front seat front and uh, your front seat height and how it will affect that um, if you're doing through if you want to keep the same front seat height and you want to go either down or up in caster size you want to make sure that your vendor will account for that um, so they couldn't just do it themselves they would have to actually go to their like I mean you could you want to just make sure you measure your front seat height before you make the change and then in your in your forks um, hopefully you have multi-position forks which allows you um, I think in, in Chelsea's, she has half inch increments um, right here that you can adjust that. So um, let's say if she wanted to go to a five inch caster and keep the same front seat height, we could go up a hole in here and it would, and you would keep generally the same, same front seat height. Um, cool. Yeah. Pretty simple, I guess. <laughs> and like Chelsea said, there's, there's a lot more things that, that come into play, wheel camber, cushion selection, backrest selection. So I have, my cushion is actually a Rojo. So it is, I have different ones, but it has full air. So I personally, and this is the last thing that we'll talk about. I personally would like to sit on an air cushion rather than a gel, because if you're looking at, I had a gel before and I've had a lot of friends that have gotten pressure sores from gel. Over time, that gel will start to harden and that's how people get pressure sores, pressure ulcers, whatever the right term is. Um, I like the air just because I literally feel like I'm sitting on a cloud. It is a little bit less sturdy, but I think over time for me personally, it is a lot better um, just because I do sit in my chair a lot. Uh, but yeah, what do you think about? Um, cushion selection, it, it varies from person to person, injury to injury. Um, what I would really encourage you to do if you have the ability to through your PT seating clinic or vendor, um, try various cushions and see if they can pressure map you. Yes. Um, what pressure mapping is, basically it's this thin piece of material um, that has sensors in it that they place, um, they place between the cushion and your rear end. And when they turn it on, when you sit on the cushion, you can actually see on the screen where your levels of pressure are. Um, I need to do that. Various color spectrums, um, red being being a lot of pressure. We really don't like red or purples. Then getting down into your green, yellows, and fading out to blues. Um, but I highly encourage you to, to get pressure mapped to find the, the appropriate cushion yeah. for you. Um, and even if you do get pressure mapped, it's, it's not going to say which cushion specifically is the best one for you, but it'll definitely help you rule out which cushions aren't the best for you. Um, but it's one of those things, just keep when you're on a new cushion, keep checking your bony prominences, your ITs, your coccyx, um, your sacrum. Um, make sure that you're not developing any um, pressure injuries. All right, so that's it for this video. And remember, there's so much more that we could talk about or Jay could talk about when it comes to a chair. There's so many different dynamics of what you can get, what you don't need to get, what you should get, etc. Um, but this video could go on for a really long time and we're probably at like 30 to 40 minutes already. So thank you guys, maybe 20, I don't know. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this felt um, educational for you guys. If you have any questions, put them down below and then maybe after this video in a week, uh, Jay and I will go through the comments and answer any questions that you guys have and I'll ask him for some suggestions. But if you like this, if you want to see more, if you have any other questions about chairs or disability people, um, you know, maybe sizing you, etc. Let us know and maybe we'll make another video and hopefully answer some more of your questions. Thanks, babe, for joining me. You're welcome. He's a lot more uh, educated on this than I am. And yeah, like I said, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. There is yeah. so much more that is involved, especially with manual chairs um, that we could get into. Um, and this is just stuff that I've learned based off my years of experience. I'm, I'm in no way the most educated on on the topic but uh, i've built a chair or two in my time and i've i found out what what kind of works what doesn't work what people like and it really like i said all comes down to finding finding a vendor that you're comfortable with 
Um, do your own research too before you go into it. Know, know what's out there, know what's available to you, um, and, and make the choice that's, that's best for you. Don't, yeah. don't let your vendors steer you into a specific direction um, because it, it helps their profit margin or it helps their sales quota or whatever it be. It's your chair. Mm -hmm. um, do whatever makes you happy because it's it's your means of mobility for the next five years. Yeah. Also, if something isn't covered, remember it's not the ATP's fault. It's your insurance. So if something is not covered by your insurance, don't fight the ATP. They are just the messenger. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can, if you have the ability to appeal any denials, mm -hmm. um, the way I like to I like to say it when you're when you're picking your chair, ask for everything. Um, as Gretzky said, you missed 100% of the goals you don't shoot at. Um, so ask for everything. If your insurance denies, um, sometimes you'll have the ability to appeal. Um, sometimes you won't, but your ATP or vendor will, will kind of help guide you in that direction based off your insurance um, and what they are able to do. But ask for everything and ask if you have the option to pay for upgrades out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Well, thank you guys for putting up with the snoring dogs over here. Uh, hope it wasn't too annoying throughout the video. Um, maybe you guys won't hear it. Maybe you will, but thanks for putting up with it. Um, we got two English Bulldogs. One is four. Her name's Stella. One is... <laughs> 15 like months? 15, or 15 weeks. weeks. And, oh, she's tired. So, thank you guys for watching. And if you guys like this video, make sure you guys hit the thumbs up, subscribe. We do a lot of vlogs and a, a bunch of other videos on this channel. So, we love you guys and have a wonderful day. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye!